Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God is a good God. Amen. And he's still in control. Amen. Amen. We just thank God for all of you being in the house tonight. And we want to start on our next church. Amen. I, I've, uh, this is the church after Sardis. Remember when Jesus gave John the word to give to the churches. By the time John would finish, he would be in a circle. Last week, we talked about the church at Sardis. This week, we want to talk about the church at Philadelphia. There were two churches in which Christ did not have a problem with. That was Smyrna, and then there's Philadelphia. Smyrna was the church in which Christ says, I've seen your works. And in part of that verse, he said, I've seen your, pro your poverty, but you are rich. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia is another church that he's seen their work, but he has no all against them because they're strong in the faith. Right, right. Amen. But there's a lot of information in this, in this, in this church and and in this this third this third chapter the seventh through the 13th verses um, the longest thing that I'm going to talk about tonight would probably be that seventh verse and I want to go ahead and attack that because it's it's got a lot of stuff in it a amen revelations three and seven says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opened and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man open. That's what Jesus says. Amen. A little a brief history um, on Philadelphia. You know, Philadelphia, the word means brotherly love. Philia is Greek. Philia is the type of love, the brotherly love, one, one among each other. Um, the city is about 25 miles southeast of Sardis. And it is an elevated city to about 800 to 900 feet. The town of Philadelphia derived its names from Adelus Philadelphus. He was the king of Pergamos and he died in 138 BC. And of the seven churches that Jesus told John to write to, Philadelphia is the one that remained the longest as a Christian city. It remained the longest as a Christian city. Jesus tells John, write this to the church at Philadelphia. And then Jesus goes into an introduction of himself to the pastor of that church. And look at what Jesus says. Jesus says that he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that open and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man open. And let's take these descriptions of himself and see why Jesus said all of this of himself as he was writing to the pastor. First of all, we notice Jesus says that he, he that is holy. And we know holy means sacred and set apart. Jesus says that he is the one who is set apart and consecrated by God. I'm the one that's sending this letter to you. I'm the one who has been who has been set apart, who is sacred, who is consecrated by God. I am the holy one 
of God. A amen. Amen. First Peter, first Peter 1 15 says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Glad I got some Bible readers in here. Amen. Back in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, God said this multiple times, be ye holy, for I am holy. If you belong to me, I want you to be like me. And because I'm holy, my expectation for you is to be holy as well. So Jesus says, he that is holy. Y'all, we got that. He said, he that is true. Jesus here implies that that which is perfect in contrast with that which is imperfect. He, he contrasts the reality to what is a shadow. It's just like looking at something that's live and then having something that's Memorex. The live is real and Memorex is just a recording. Are y'all with me? Jesus said that I am true. He that is true. Jesus is declaring that all titles and names given to him are realized in him. Everything they called me, everything they said about me in the prophets, it is true. I am the one. Every title that they name, I am it. He said, he said the idea and the fact in him are what they what they can never be in anybody else. Absolutely commensurate. What does commensurate mean? Let's break that down. Commensurate means as Jesus or God would say, I am that I am. What they say I am, that's what I am. When we look at Isaiah, Isaiah called him a lot of titles in Isaiah nine and that nine chapter and that sixth verse. He said unto us, <laughs> a child is born. Unto us a son is given and his name shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Jesus said whatever they wrote about me, it's true of who I am. This is what Jesus said. In other words, he said, there's no one or nothing that can bear the title to be fully holy and all true. But him, he is the only one who can be fully holy and all true. Oh, yeah, we 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 are holy. We got to be holy because without holiness, no man can see God. We got to be holy, but we're not fully holy because we're still flesh and blood. Can I get some help in here? We're not fully holy. You will never be fully holy because you got too much Adam in you. <laughs> you, you got you got too much Adam. Jesus is the only person ever born with no Adam in him. <laughs> because because remember, his birth is of the Lord and the whole of God and the Holy Ghost. Remember, Mary said, how can this be? And I haven't known a man. And what did Jesus, what did, what did the angel Gabriel tell her? He said, don't worry about a man. He said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. And the power of the most high shall overshadow you. And this holy thing that is born unto you shall be called the son of God. <laughs> so Jesus said, I am fully holy. And then he said, then he said, not only fully holy, but he said, I am all true. We got to have some truth in us, but we're not all true. Because we still got some mess in us somewhere. Amen. Or, or we're liable to allow mess to come up. Amen. So we're not all true. That's what Jesus said in John 14 and six. He said, I am the way, the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the father, but by me. I'm the only way that man could get it. And I've heard folks talking about that. I've heard Oprah. Steve Harvey, these people that got money and feel like they know God like that. Yeah, there are multiple ways to go to heaven. The devil is a lie. Amen. Jesus said, if you don't come through me, guess what? You ain't getting there. Don't believe in him. You're not getting there. A amen. 
So he said, he that is holy, he that is true. And then he introduced himself. He said, he that has the key of David. He that has the key of David had to, had to look into that one. He that has the key of David. When you're talking about keys, keys are keys are unique. The master or the owner of a house or, or, or the master of a family has one or more keys wherewith he can open or shut any door that's in his house. If you are the owner of a house, you have the keys to open and shut any doors in that house because it's your stuff. Mm -hmm. You are the one who has access. You are the one who can give access and you can take access away. Uh, are are y'all with me? Now, when he says here that he has the key of David, David had a key which was a token of right and sovereignty. Jesus Christ is the son of David. He has the key to the spiritual city of David called New Jerusalem. Follow me, follow me. He has the supreme right, power, and authority as in his own house. Jesus has the key to everything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. All, everything. He owns everything. He has the key to everything. Are are y'all, are y'all still with me? Isaiah 22 and and 22. It said this about the key of David. He said, and the key of the house of David will lay upon his shoulders. So he shall open, none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. The prophet Isaiah here was talking about that man named Jesus. You have the key of David to that spiritual city of David called New Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven. Are are y'all with me? All right. Watch this. Watch this. He is the one who can open the door and no man can shut it. He's the one who can close the door and no man can open it. Jesus is the one who opens the door to heaven and hell. He has all the keys to heaven. And he has the keys to hell. And he's the one who will open it up to let us into heaven and also open up hell and put us in hell. Are y'all with me? Amen. Amen. Jesus is the door to heaven. He is the only one who can shut or open either door. If he opens the door to heaven and let you in, he'll close it. You can't get out. If he opens the door to hell, he's going to let you, he's going to put you out there in it. He's going to close it up. And guess what? You're not going to get out. Ask, ask the rich man. Ask the rich man who, who, who wouldn't give Lazarus the crumbs that fell from his table. And when he died that night, he opened his eyes in hell and looked off afar and saw Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and cried out, Father Abraham, send Lazarus down here. Let him dip his finger in some water so he can he can cool my parching tongue. I'm being tormented down here in this place. Abraham told him, "Uh -uh, there's a great gulf between us and you can't get it. You can't get out and he can't get into you. Jesus has these keys. Watch this. Now watch this. Watch this. The master of the house has all these keys to every room, every door, everything. He has the key to everything in his house. He owns it. Everything he owns. He ha- if he has a shed in the back, he has the key to it. If he has a tractor, he has a key to it. He has a car. He has a key to it. He has keys to everything. Are, y- are y'all with me? Having keys shows authority and power. He has authority over his house because he has all the keys. Now, if he has a huge house, huge land, he owns all of this stuff. Most of the time, if a master has all of this, he's going to have some servants. And for those faithful servants, those good and faithful servants, 
The master will share his keys because he trusts him. He'll get his keys and give it to his servants, his good servants, his faithful servants, and he will allow them access to his house. <laughs> are are, are y'all with me? Are, are y'all are y'all with me? Jesus with his keys shares his keys with his good and faithful servants. Now I got I got I gotta give you word. I gotta give you word to help you help you out here. In Matthew 16, the Bible says that Jesus and his disciples were walking the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And then Jesus all of a sudden asked him a question. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And it says some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say that thou art Jeremiah. Some say thou art Elijah. Some say you, that, that prophet. And then Jesus said, but whom do you say that I am? And then Simon blurted out, thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood, he says, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And notice what Jesus told them. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. But get this, what he told Peter. He said, and I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shall bound or lock up on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou unlock or loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. <laughs> the, these keys, these keys. See, you got to understand these keys that Jesus give. He gives them to his good and faithful servant. Everybody don't get the keys. Everybody don't get the keys. Just like I told you, everybody that stand up here don't have the keys. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus know the real from the unreal. A, 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 amen. We're going to go on because I, I, I just got, got a little bit of time. Okay, we're going to go on. Jesus Christ is the only one who can give his servants authority and access into the revelation of his kingdom. Everybody ain't real that come to you with some revelation that God showed them. Some people are hearing stuff and they're going back and repeating what somebody else said and trying to give credit that they heard it. But the true servants of God are the ones in which Jesus said, here's the key. I want you to unlock some revelation that I'm going to show you. Yes, Lord. Have mercy. <laughs> so Jesus described himself to the pastor at Philadelphia and letting them know this, you know, and he said, he said, I got these keys. I can open the door and no man can shut it and I can close the door and no man can open it. Amen. He goes on a little further. That's probably the longest verse that I'm going to go over tonight. We're going to finish the rest of because that's a that's a message all by itself right there. That's a lesson all by itself. Amen. Look at verse eight. Look at verse eight. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. And hath not denied my name. Jesus is telling his church at Philadelphia that he sees how diligent they are in their work for the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. In other words, Jesus says, I have given you power and an opportunity to spread the gospel and no man or no demon in hell can stop you from doing what I'm opening the door for you to do. If God calls us to a work, nobody can stop us from doing that work except us. A Amen, somebody. If God, if Jesus says, I have opened the door for you, that means that if he opened the door, nobody can block your progress from stepping through that door. 
Whatever God gives for you or open up for you, whatever God has for you, it is for you. And, it, and if God sees that I know you got this, he ain't going to have no opposition. He ain't going to have no stops. He ain't going to have nothing that will delay you getting what he has for you. Uh, are y'all with me? Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. It says, it says here, Jesus because Jesus has opened the door, this can't be closed. It is very interesting that Jesus says to this church, it has a little strength. You have a little bit of strength. Theologians have gone back and forth wondering why Jesus says that this church has a little bit of strength. Now, this statement can mean a few things here. First of all, it could mean when he said you have a little bit of strength, it can mean that the church has gone through much persecution, affliction, temptation, but yet they were not dead. And some of us can testify tonight, we've had some stuff going on in our lives, but we still here. I mean, I mean, you can have that testimony that the devil tried to take me out, but I'm still here. <laughs> a -a Amen. He, he, he put you through this. He put you through that. He allowed this to come up. He allowed this to come up. You get tired along the way, but you're still here. He, he never promised that you won't get tired on this journey. If you are walking after Christ, you're going to get tired. You're going to get sick and tired sometimes. And you're going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Don't give up. <laughs> but don't give up. You keep that little strength that you got. And in your weakness, that's when you will be strong. In, in, in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul says, you know, I, 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 I'm, I know that I'm anointed. I know that God has done. God even took me into the third heaven about 14 years ago. And I saw things so wonderful that I can't even utter. I can't even tell you how beautiful it was. I cannot even describe you, uh, describe to you what has happened. But there was a, there was a, there was a thorn given to me. <laughs> it, it, was, it was sent by the, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And I went to the Lord thrice. I went to the Lord three times and I asked him to take it away. But then he never answered me. But then when he decided to answer me, he came to me and said, my grace is sufficient. He said, now, when you're weak, that's when I'm strong inside of you. And see, that's a word for some of us in here. When you are weak, just don't give up because that's when Jesus show his power. That's, that's when he that's when he shows his power. That's when he shows his power. So they've been through a lot and they're weak, but the Lord is still with. And if the Lord is still with you in your weakness, you're still strong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. So that's the first thing he told the church at Philadelphia. You have little strength. It could be because of the stuff that they have gone through. Amen. Secondly, he said that it could be that they have a little strength because it could mean that they are few in number. So it seems that if you're few in number, you might be weak. Amen. When you're few in number, a lot of people feel that you can't do it. They do a lot because you just got a few people and you can't accomplish some stuff. But the few people along with God. <laughs> can accomplish anything if you come together on one accord you can accomplish anything with the Lord amen Jesus said get together call me out and call and when you when two or three gather in my name he said that I will be in the midst if Jesus is in the midst things can happen because he told him, this is this is pretty much what he's telling this church. I know that I know that you have little strength. It might just be a few of you, but I'm with you. And if Jesus be for you, who can be against you? <laughs> who can be against you? 
A amen. Amen. So that's that's the second thing. He may have said that they had little strength because they were few in number. And thirdly, thirdly, he, he may have said they had little strength because they were not energized as they should have been, but they were not wholly dead. Which means that they were not enthusiastic as they used to be because of the stuff that was going on around them. Sometimes trials and tribulations in your life can lower your praise. Yes. You, you still you still love the Lord, you know, you know that you love the Lord and stuff. But sometimes the troubles of this life can get you down. Yes. Amen. You can go through a struggle so long that that it'll make your praise go down. Oh, you trusted in God. But sometimes it makes you it makes you weak and it zaps your strength. And, and, and then Jesus has to show up to re-energize you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. So 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 these things, that's this is why he might have said that you have little strength. And what of the reason they had a little strength? Jesus lets them know that he's seen their weakness and has opened the door before them for them to enter into. He said, I saw that you have little strength. I saw that you're weak. So guess what I'm going to do? He said, I'm going to open the door for you <laughs> because sometimes we need a little help. To get to the place where the Lord needs us to be. And sometimes it takes the Lord himself to help us. Amen. You can't do this thing all by yourself. And you ain't going to have pastor with you all the time. Or you ain't going to have deacon with you or your prayer partner with you all the time. Sometimes it just has to be you and Jesus. He says, so, so he said, we got an open door. I opened the door for you. The open door could represent several things. First of all, the open door, it could be the ability to do good. I, I'm opening a door. I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to do ministry. I'm giving you the opportunity to proclaim my name, to do something, to do good. Secondly, the open door, it could be the privilege of access to the heavenly palace. Which means that I'm opening the door so that you will have my grace and access to what I have promised you. Thirdly, the open door, it may mean that they had before them an open way to egress from danger and persecution. Egress, E-G-R-E-S-S, -S, to egress. It means to leave or to get out of. The open door might be a way of escape from the persecution that's coming. <laughs> we claim that Jesus is a deliverer. Sometimes we can be in situations that are not good for us and God opens a door for us. We just got to know how to step into it and keep on going. So, so. Sometimes we get in, sometimes we get in friendships and relationships and, and things we know that we ain't got no kind of business being in. And then we all struggle and praying, Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. And didn't that joker walk out your life or that woman leave you or those friends turn their back away? And then God is saying, see, I now I've opened that door. Step into it so I can close it. He gives us a way of escape. See, that's just like in Hebrews is talking about when we have temptation. Temptation, we say, oh, temptation is so hard. But Jesus said, no, I ain't going to give you no temptation that's so strong that you cannot resist it. He said, now, if I give you, if I show you, if the temptation come along, he said, I'm also going to give you a way out of it. He will give you a way to egress. That's a, that's a word for y'all to know tonight. That's a twenty dollar word right there. Egress. E G R E S S. It means to leave or to get out of. <laughs> Amen. He will open a door for you to get. Now, once you step in that door, don't try to get back in it. Let him close it and go on about your business. Remember, he's the one that opens the door that no man can shut and he closes doors that no man can open. 
So he's telling them, I got you. I got you. I know. I know how weak you are. I know you just have a little strength. So I'm going to open the door for you. Now, I want you to step in it and let me close it back. So Jesus praises this church. He said, you got a little strength, just a little bit of strength. He said, but you've kept my word. No matter how weak you may have been, no matter how few you are, you have kept my word. This is all in the eighth verse right there. You've kept my word. And in them keep we too must be careful to guard the word of God. The Bible is our instruction book for living. And if we change the instructions in any way, it will not work for us. Mm. Many have watered down the word of God until it has short circuited and lost its power. Amen. Scared preachers, scared pastors. People scared to say what thus saith the Lord because somebody might be offended, might get their feelings hurt. Amen. I'm worried about your soul. I ain't worried about your feelings. If it's in the word, you're going to hear it sooner or later. It's coming for you. <laughs> Amen. Sooner or later, it's coming for you. But, it's, uh, but I, I would rather see your feelings hurt and your soul saved. Then worried about you whether or not you're going to like me. Amen. You cannot change the instructions and the instructions don't change. When you keep God's word, that means that you don't compromise. When you keep God's word, that means that you don't tolerate. When you keep God's word, that means that you stick to what the book says and don't change what it says. If you have a recipe, if you, if you have a recipe that you want to try and you want it to turn out just like the picture got, then you got to follow the recipe to the tea. Because as soon as you want to put a little more dab of this and a little more dab of that and well, I don't like that. Let me stick this in here. It is not going to be what you have on that picture. So if you want things to turn out the way that the Lord tells you that they'll turn out, then you got to follow the instructions. Are y'all with me? Amen. You got to follow the instruction. Amen. But a lot of us, we try to tamper with the word of God. The church of Philadelphia might be small in size, but they're big in love and the Holy Spirit and they stand on his word. Jesus said, you have kept my word. Today, when we look at things more and more churches are denying the name of Jesus because Jesus said they have not denied his name. More and more churches are denying the name of Jesus. They are denying that Jesus is God. They want to say that Jesus is some just some prophet or somebody separate. Right. But Jesus is God. Amen. And very few realize that he is God manifested in flesh. He is God, the son. That's why John wrote in John 1, said in the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it breaks it down and tells us who the word was in John, 4, in John 1 and 14 when he said, and the word became flesh. The word who was God became flesh, walked among us and we beheld the, his glory as of the only begotten son of the father talking about Jesus. And Jesus is God. When the disciple said, when the disciple said, show us the father, Jesus said, have I been with you that long? You don't know if you've seen me. <laughs> he said, I and the father are as, are as one. I and the father are as one. A -a Amen. Amen. Too many churches are folding to the pressures of of the world and are not proclaiming the name of Jesus. They, they want to, they're pulling the world in and say, you got to do this if you want to draw in members. You, you, if you want to draw in young people, you got to do this right here. You got to have this going on and you got to have that going on. But the word don't change. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw 
all men unto me. And that means young ones, old ones, fat ones, skinny ones. He said, I'll draw all men unto me. So we cannot de deny who Jesus is. We cannot deny the name of Jesus. It, it, Jesus says here in Matthew 10, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. And I don't want to get to heaven. And Jesus says, I don't know you depart from me. I don't want to stand before Christ on that judgment day. And he said, I don't know you. Your work was of iniquity. And we're going to jump there. Some people going to jump there claiming, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do many marvelous work? And Jesus is going to say, I, yeah, you might have done that, but I don't know you still. You weren't mine. Amen. Mm. Even if it cost us our lives, we should never deny the name of Jesus. Because there's something about the name of Jesus. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus, healing in the name of Jesus, deliverance in the name of Jesus, love in the name of Jesus, joy in the name of Jesus, peace in the name of Jesus. Hope is in the name of Jesus. And in the book of Acts, it tells us by no other name in heaven or in earth can man be saved but by the name of Jesus. So there's something about the name of Jesus. A -a Amen. Amen. That next verse, that next verse, that next verse. He said, I know Jesus said, Jesus told him in that verse eight, I know your works and I see I've opened a door for you. I know you're weak, but you kept my word and not denied my name. Then in verse nine, it said, behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Because I will make them to come and worship before you, before thy feet and to know that I've loved thee. Amen. Jesus says here when he was talking about the synagogue of Satan, the synagogue of Satan is a place of worship where God is not Lord. Any place of worship where God is not Lord. OK, straighten that out, Kala. What are, you, what, are you, what are you talking about? A Jewish synagogue. Let's take a Jewish synagogue. It could be a it could be of Satan if evil prevailed in that synagogue. A Jewish synagogue. But, but let's bring it home. A church or a body of Christians meeting could also be. A synagogue of Satan. Why or how? If the true word of God is not taught and received. If you teaching any other gospel, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are in a synagogue of Satan. If you're telling folks that God didn't mean what God said, you're in a synagogue of Satan. A -a -a Amen. And, and there's no difference in someone who follows Satan and someone who pretends to be a Christian and is not because both of them are lost. If you walk around saying I'm a Christian and you have no Jesus in your heart. You're no better than that one to say Satan is my master because both of y'all are lost. If you don't have Jesus, you are lost. Bottom, bottom line, there's no other way to get into glory without having Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, if you deny Jesus, you will not make it in. Mm hmm. He said, now, those of the synagogue of Satan, he said, which say they're Jews. Now, in this instance here, when he say that, he said, who say they're Jews, he's talking about spiritually and not biologically. Because none of us in here were born in Israel. All 
Anybody with him born in Israel? Because, you know, you might have military families or something like that. Anybody? Nobody in here was born in Israel. So you are not a Jew biologically. But spiritually, if we are born again, we are of the seed of Abraham. So that makes us Jews in the spirit. Amen. What Jesus is saying here now, when he's talking about their Jews, when he's saying here now, it refers to anybody. If you say that they're, they say that they're Jews and they're not anybody who rejects Jesus Christ is not a Jew spiritually. Anybody who rejects Jesus Christ is not a Jew spiritually. And this is what he mean here. He said that they say they're Jews, but they're not because they rejected Jesus Christ. Paul explained it best what a Jew is in Romans, the second chapter, 28 and 29. Look at what Paul said. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Just because you have the darker skin and the beard and you wear the yarmulke on your head, it don't make you a Jew. Just because you were circumcised after the eighth day of birth, it doesn't make you a Jew. But here Jesus is saying, Paul is saying, this is what a Jew is. A Jew is not somebody outward in the flesh, but a Jew is somebody, it's what you got on the inside. Amen. Touch your neighbor and tell him it's an inside job. <laughs> Touch him again and tell him it's an inside job. Amen. It's all about what's on the inside. A -a Amen. He said, but a Jew, which is one inwardly, and they have, to ha they have to be circumcised. But the circumcision is of the heart and not of the flesh. Amen. They have to be, they have to have a circumcision of the heart. And then it also, also, and it's not about the letter. It's not about, it doesn't have to do with the law, but it has to do with the spirit of God. Amen. That's who a Jew is. Paul says, whose praise is not of men, but of God. That makes that makes you a Jew. And if we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal savior, every one of us are Jews in here. We're black Jews. <laughs> so the Hebrew Israelite, y'all half right. <laughs> y'all half right. <laughs> and the word backs you up. Now, all that mess y'all talking about, y'all off the chain with that right there. But you got to stick with the word. Amen. 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 So let's, let's, let's see what he says in that third, that third chapter, 10th verse. Let's see what he says in the next verse. He said, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And I had to had to dig it a little bit into this and figure out what Jesus was talking about when he said, but because thou has kept the word of my patience, the word of my patience. I, 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 I consulted a, a few of them. Uh, I looked at um, looked at Jameson and and looked at um, some Elliot and some Benson and tried to get an understanding of this. But John Gill had the clearest the clearest definition of this. What what is meant by the word of my patience? John Gill said is nothing more than the gospel. And he explained what he meant when he said it's so called the gospel. It is the gospel and it's so called the word of my patience because it's it gives an account of the patience of Jesus Christ in the midst of all of his outward meanness that came to him and also his humiliation. But yet he was patient in the process. And that same word is what keeping us right now. The word of his patience. What causes us to go on a little bit further? Because we have his word. What causes us not to do what flesh wants to do? Is his word. What does David say? Thy word have I hid in my heart 
that I might not sin against thee. His word is keeping us right now. Amen. And the one who keeps God's word is one who will be kept by God. <laughs> Rewind in my mind. The one who keeps God's word is the one who will be kept by God. If we keep the word of his patience, God will keep us in his patience. Amen. Amen. Now look at this. This promise, this promise in this verse is twofold. First of all, it is it is for the church at Philadelphia and also for the church today. Firstly, God promised to keep the ministers of the church, which is which were at Philadelphia from those persecutions which raised elsewhere, which raised el elsewhere and were further to come upon all Christians living under the Roman Empire during the time of Titus, the emperor. Israel was bombarded by the Romans, but it was walled in. But the Romans wanted to try to get into Jerusalem, but they could not. And then at the same time, there were things going on inside of Jerusalem that they couldn't get out. They wanted to try to they wanted to try to um, um, starve all of the inhabitants to die. But God intervened. And before they were totally annihilated, God intervened and allowed all of it to stop. The Romans got in. Yes, they got in, but they saved those, those believing Jews. It is the same thing that Jesus was saying when he was in Matthew 24, when he was talking to his apostles and he was telling them, he said, there's going to come a time when they were looking at the temple and they were saying how beautiful it is. And Jesus said, there's going to come a time where not one stone will be unturned. Which means that they're going to come in and they're going to mess up all of this. But he's saying, I'm going to be with you, though. I'm going to be with you. And this is the earnest of the great last tribulation before Christ is coming, which means that what happened to the Jews in this time when the Romans came in. And Jesus shortened the days, which means that before they were killed, he stepped in and allowed the Romans to come in and save them because Titus is recorded saying by Josephus, he's recorded saying that it was nobody but Jesus who allowed us to save them. <laughs> A Roman king that said that and Roman emperor that said that. If God would not have permitted them to get in, they would not have made it in. Not knowing that it was to save those believing Jews. That remnant. That remnant. Amen. But it was all a foreshadowing of what is to come. Because secondly, this verse represents the promise that Christ will rapture genuine believers out of this world before the tribulation period begins. Which means that when that awful day of the Lord come, guess what? Y'all might be here, but I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you better make up your mind now. I'm not trying to rush Christ to come now. I ain't trying to rush, but you better be ready just in case. There's a day when Christ is going to come in his glory. And he's going to when he comes, when that, that sky crack open and he's going to come on that cloud. The trumpet is going to sound or his voice is going to cry out for all of his. The book of Thessalonians tell us that the dead in Christ will rise first. And after they arrive, after they've risen and kept caught up in the sky with Christ, those of us who are still alive will be translated or will be changed in a moment in the twinkling, thank you, Sister Vera, in the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. It's going to come. And when we are taken away, Christ is going to unleash those angels on the earth and here comes the tribulation. Woo -hoo -hoo. Here comes the tribulation. And if you hadn't received the Holy Ghost and gone back with him, I feel sorry for you. 
Hey, amen. In that verse, he talks about the hour of temptation. It's the period of worldwide testing, which has not yet occurred, but is spoken of in Daniel 12 in the Old Testament and also Matthew 24 when Jesus was talking. And he promises to keep them from and out of the period of tribulation. He said they will not even enter into the period of that period of history. The tribulation is for the purpose of trying or judging them that dwell upon the earth. Those who are connected to the earth and the earth systems. Believers are not even included in this time of tribulation. So that's why you have to be ready at all times. Watch. Well, let's pray. Keep your eyes open. Matthew 24, 21, 22 says, for then shall the great tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, for the saved sake, those days will be short. Christ says, if I don't if I don't come and shorten the days, if I don't come and shorten the day, everybody will be lost. Because the Antichrist is going to fool a lot of folks. The Antichrist ain't going to be somebody with horns and a red tail and all this stuff. He's going to look just like a, he's going to look religious. He's going to look religious. He's going to look like he's spiritual. But he's going to be of Satan. Antichrist means against Christ. A Amen. Amen. Let's look at that 11th verse. Look at that 11th verse. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Jesus said, I come quickly. Jesus is coming quickly to his saints from the hour of temptation. He comes for the reformed church at the onset of the hour of temptation, which will be at the beginning of this period of tribulation. Figuratively, this has occurred during the reign of Titus of Rome when God saved the believing Jews from total annihilation at the hands of Romans and unbelieving Jews within the city. But that was a shadow of what was to come for the whole world. Jesus is coming to help and deliver. He's coming to save and preserve the truly godly among them. He is coming to destroy Antichrist and introduce the latter day glory, the millennial reign. Jesus will return to take his church out of the hour of trial. He's coming back. I know we've been hearing that all our lives and every day it's closer to the time he comes back than the day before. Amen. God is not slack of his promises. What we consider slackness is long suffering because God don't want anybody to be lost. But some folk going to go to hell because the book of Isaiah says hell enlarges its mouth daily. So Jesus is encouraging the believers at Philadelphia and us today to hold fast, which thou hast. He tells them to hold fast. Get a tight grip on the doctrines of the gospel and the ordinances of it, which the church had received as delivered by Christ and his apostles. So whatever, and Paul says it in several of his letters, whatever you received at first, hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold on to the profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. And do not allow any man or anything to take your crown. That's what he says up there in that 11th verse. Don't let any man take your crown. Don't allow anyone to cause you to forfeit what the Lord has promised to give you. That is that crown of life. That garland, as it's called. Those, those it look like feathers or the little leaves, those little crowns. The crown of life that he's promised you, that he's going to give you in that day. <laughs> Amen. 
And Jesus says in Revelation 22 and 12, and when he comes back, he's going to, he's got it. He says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work, what, according to as his work shall be. His reward is going to be with him when he comes to get us. He's coming back for his church. So she will not have to face the tribulation period. That's called grace. That, that's his mercy and his grace. Because Christ can allow us to suffer just like everybody else. But that tribulation is going to be so great. He said, no, I love you. Too, I love you too much to let you go through that. So he's going to pull us out of it. Let's go ahead and put a close on this right here. Look at verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Boy, look at what Christ, he said a mouthful there. First of all, he said, him that overcomes. He'll be the one that in the hour of temptation and the period of time will stand his ground, sustain the shock of the beast with courage and fearlessness and overcomes him. Revelation 12 tells about those who are standing before the throne of God. The one who overcome the beast. How did they overcome? By the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. Amen. When the when temptation came to them, they stood on God's word. They stood on God's word. Amen. And professed Jesus. And watch this. When it talks about Jesus said that I will make an overcomer a pillar in the temple of God. And when Jesus uses the term pillar. He could have been referring to those who have proven to be strong support for his church down here. This person is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This term pillar is here is referring to a natural emblem of stability. And permanence. In other words, it ain't going nowhere. When you think of a pillar, just like out there on the front porch, when you think of a pillar, they are solid. They are standing there. They ain't going nowhere. They're not going anywhere. Now watch this. This is why Jesus said afterward, he shall go no more out. He will be permanently fixed in that spiritual temple of God. Now, when we talk about the temple of God, we shouldn't put in mind talking about church. When he says the temple of my God, he's not talking about church. He's not talking about Solomon's temple. He's not talking about the second temple. When he says the temple of God, he's not talking about a building. Amen. Because Revelation 21 tells us in that new city of Jerusalem, there will be no temple. There ain't going to be no temple. We ain't going to have church. When we go into that new city of Jerusalem, you ain't going to find no church. A Amen. Amen. That where there'll be no more temple in, in New Jerusalem. So this temple of God is an image of us dwelling in God and in the Lamb of God when we receive our eternal reward in New Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that there will be no sun, no moon, because the light that's going to light that city will be God himself. So ain't going to be no, uh, his glory is going to light up that city. Amen. And we are going to dwell in him in that city. Amen. We're going to dwell in him. The overcomer will have the name of God written on him. Now this symbolizes, if he had the name written on him, that symbolizes that he belongs to God. Amen. You know people get those tattoos of of their, their babe and their boo right here saying like, yeah, I belong to the stupid over here or something like that. <laughs> hey, hey, amen. You say here, you say here, I, Jesus says, I'm going to put, 
I'm going to write the name of God on you, showing that you belong to him. Amen. Showing that you belong to him. See, let me tell you about this. If something have a name on it, that shows that you own that. When we were growing up and we were in and out, you know, we used to, we used to have we didn't have no dishes that we didn't have no china sets. We had mismatched plates and all and jelly jars and all this stuff right here. But during the summer when we were home, we were in and out the house drinking water and stuff like that. Mama wouldn't let us drink out of glass. We had to get a cup. And, and all the all the cups looked the same. And, but but see, we were we were kind of nice, nasty where we didn't want to drink after anybody. Where we get our little dirty hands and eat with dirty hands and stuff, but we didn't want to drink after anybody. So what we would do, we would write our name on the cup and put it down on the table or, or stick it on, a, or write it on a, a soda bottle and stick it in the refrigerator because if nobody's name was on it, it was free game. You go in the house, who drunk my soda? We ain't know who it was or anything. But if it's got your name on it, that means it belonged to you. Are, are y'all with me? Nobody touched that because it's mine. And I'm the kind, don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> Amen. So Jesus said, I'm going to write the name of God on you to show that you belong to him. Amen. He was tattooed on him. Amen. <laughs> hey, I don't mind having God, but see, Jesus will have to be the one to tattoo it on you, baby. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And it is an honor to have our God's name written on us showing that we belong to him. And even the city of God, New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven, will be written upon him, the overcomer, to show that he is a citizen of that city. So I'm going to have God's name on me. I'm going to have New Jerusalem written on me to show that I belong to him. I'm a citizen of this. And guess what? And finally, Jesus said, I'm going to write my new name on you. I'm going to write my new name on you. And he said that it will be a time of him being glorified. This is the overcomer, as Paul speaks of in Romans 8 and, and 31, um, 8 and 30, where he says, moreover, to for whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. We have not made it to that glorified state yet. That is the last step when we get to Jesus. <laughs> yeah, we see, we've, we've gone through the state he foreknew us. We've gone through that place where he predestinated us. We've gone through that state where he's called us. We've gone through that state where he's justified us. And now all we're waiting on is the glorification to be glorified. And when we reach that glorified state, he's going to have God's name on it. He's going to have uh, he's going to have the city's name on it where we will represent that city. And Jesus say, I'm going to put my stamp on you also. And what name it'll be, I don't know. Will it be Jehovah? Will it be the King of Righteousness? Will it be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? As the book of Revelation says, when he come riding on his white horse in all of his glory, he'll have it on his thighs saying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I don't care what it is. Just stamp me, Jesus. Stamp me. Seal me. <laughs> In my forehead, on the top of my head. Oh, I mean, I, I don't care. Seal me. Yeah, amen. Amen. And that'll show with Jesus' name that we are partakers in his glory. A amen. And the last verse, and the last verse, and the last verse. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Again, we hear Jesus ending up here saying that the spirit is talking to the churches. Jesus is telling them that as all these messages to these churches are printed, as he's saying this, he reminds us once again to open our ears 
to our understanding of his teaching. Amen. And that's the book of Philadelphia. Amen. Every word that is spoken applies to us today. As we started this study on these churches, I've told you that what Jesus wrote to these churches, we can find ourselves in these churches. Anything that was written, as Paul wrote, anything that was written aforetime is written for our learning. The examples that God gave is for our learning and our understanding. What they went through, we should understand. We should have a better understanding why God did what God did, why God said what God said. We should understand that we shouldn't make the same mistakes that they did, but we still do. Amen. A amen. But whatever God says, whatever the spirit of the Lord says, the churches should open their ears and listen to what God says. Amen. Any questions, comments? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.